Alrighty, so this lecture will cover inheritance as well as talking more specifically about not only how we acquire genes, but how you can decide or how you can decipher how genes are going to be split between one parent to the next. Um, so this is a great picture just talking about a disease in this case in which you have an affected father and a mother who's a carrier. We'll talk about what these genomes are called and how that can affect their offspring. So a little history lesson, heredity is um, just essentially the study of how we inherit our genes. So this field was started by Dr. Gregor Mendel, and he was a botanist, meaning he worked with plants. So at the time he started his work, there was not really a very clear understanding of how certain plants got different features from one seed to the next. Um, so he actually used pea plants to be able to trace what we called is a trait. So you've heard of a trait before. It's something you have. Maybe a trait in your family is uh, hazel eyes. Maybe a trait is um, olive skin. Maybe a trait is freckles. Some, of, some type of identifiable, identifiable characteristic that's found in an organism. So as it relates to plants, a trait could be a color of the flower, a uh, height of the plant, the, um, the texture of the seed. All these things were traits that he, were he was able to connect from plants. And then we can, of course, relate it to humans and other organisms. So here are some really critical genetic terms that I want you to understand. The first one is a phenotype. So the same way you, you know the word physical, right? Physical means how something looks. Um, starts with pH. Think of that with a phenotype. A phenotype is something that you can clearly observe. So in this case, tall smooth, like I said, color, um, texture, something like that is going to be a phenotype. This is a characteristic that you can observe. So when we're going to talk about how to pass genes and how to pass traits from one parent to the offspring, we have to make sure if I ever ask you questions about phenotype, you know I'm talking about a physical component. Genotype. A genotype are the specific genes that make up that phenotype. So it's going to be those alleles, which I'll explain what an allele is in a second, that it makes up that physical trait. So let's say this was the genotype for being tall, while this is the genotype of being smooth. These are the genes. I'm not sure if you remember when we talked about uh, meiosis, how one parent contributes this chromosome and another parent will contribute another chromosome. An allele, which I'll talk about in a second, is where you get that information from parent A and parent B. So when you see something that says big T, little t, that's because one parent said big T, the other parent said little t. So that's just kind of a, you know, relation to what we've talked about before to maybe kind of put everything together. So speaking of big T and little t, let's talk about dominant and recessive traits. So a dominant trait is going to be the displayed trait. So D for dominant, D for displayed. Think of a dominant um, trait being as the thing that's the most overpowering. And I'll give you some examples in a second. Overpowering. Um, so for example, it would be tall stems. It's going to be more common for your stems to be tall than for them to be short. It's going to be purple flowers. So it's going to be more common for your flowers to be purple than it is to be something like white. And I'm going to give you an example of that um, in just a second when we talk about recessive. So recessive is going to be a trait that is somewhat mass. So it's kind of, think of it as being hidden or being um, um, not as strong, right? So anytime you have a recessive trait, it can be covered up or hidden, especially when it's in the presence of a dominant trait. So an example here would be dwarf stems or, or small stems and then white flowers. A great example, let's say I was drawing you a picture. I don't have a white um, color on this marker, but let's say I'm drawing something that's yellow. Yellow is very light, it's not as strong. This will be an example of a recessive color, right? It's very low. Let's say I have a dominant color like black or blue or something really strong. If I have the black go over, or if I have the dominant go over the recessive or the black go over the yellow, you no longer see the yellow at all. That's because that dominant is so overpowering. It's going to override it. So when we're talking about alleles or these letters that I talked about, dominant letters are going to be uppercase because, the, you know, obviously they're bigger. 
and recessive letters are going to be lowercase. So we'll talk about alleles in a second. You can use any letter in the alphabet once we get to that part, but anytime you see something capital, it's going to be dominant. Anytime you see it lowercase, it's going to be recessive. So that's a lot of bit of information here, but I want y'all to kind of start to pull these concepts together. Okay, so again, my example, um, this is going to be showing dominant versus recessive. So dominant is going to be um, uppercase while recessive is lowercase. Again, dominant is going to be referring to the trait that's stronger. So even for eye color, for us, a dominant eye color is brown. A recessive eye color is something like blue or hazel. You don't see that too much because most of the time, um, let's say you have two dominant alleles or two uppercase letters. Let's say it's purple or we talked about brown eyes. You would have brown eyes. You would need two lower or two recessive alleles to give you something light. So in this case of a flower, it's white. But if we're talking about eye color, that would be like your hazel or your blue eyes. And then even when you have half and half, so um, one allele that is dominant, one allele that's recessive, like when I drew over the yellow and the blue in the former picture right here, you're still only going to see that dominant allele shine through because it's so powerful. So that's an example with flowers. That's another example with eye color. And then again, you're seeing the dominant and recessive alleles here. Okay, so some definitions, some more definitions. I've been saying this word allele a lot. So an allele is just one possible form of a gene. Um, every time we're talking about alleles, we want to make sure we keep the same letter. The only thing we're going to change is going to be the casing of the letter. So is it going to be uppercase or lowercase? So in this um, example here, we're talking about a seed, I believe. So it's a smooth seed or wrinkled seed. You see it's either going to be an uppercase S or the allele will be uppercase or dominant, meaning it's smooth, or it will be a lowercase S, um, which would give it, make it wrinkled. So even though we're talking about smooth and wrinkled, I don't want to see any examples in which you see something like, um, this is going to be smooth, this is going to be wrinkled, right? They're different letters. The only thing you need to be changing is the the um, casing. So is it uppercase S, lowercase S? Or even if you wanted to make it W, is the uppercase W mean smooth and the lowercase W mean wrinkled? They just have to be the same letter. Um, so again, these alleles are going to be distinguished by the phenotypical um, effects. So whether it's you know a stronger allele or dominant allele, it's going to be smooth. A recessive allele is going to be wrinkled. Um, so the alleles and the phenotype are going to match up a bit. And then the location on the gene that we find that allele, that's called a locus. So if you go back to this image here, the location we find that gene, whether it's dominant or receptive, that's going to be the locus on that particular chromosome. So homozygous. If you notice, um, we see sometimes you have two of the same allele. So they're either going to be two uppercase letters or two dominant letters, or they're going to be two lowercase letters, which you see here. Anytime you see two alleles that are the same, we have to call that homozygous. So eight, the stem word H-O-M-O -O means same, like if you've heard of homozygous mixture, anything like that, it's going to be the same. So it's going to be the same allele, either two uppercase letters or two lowercase letters. When you see the word homozygous, the next question you should ask yourself is, is it homozygous dominant or is it homozygous recessive? Because if I just gave you the word homozygous, you need to be saying, well, are we talking about two dominant traits or are we talking about two recessive traits? So anytime you see it written, it's going to be homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive. Um, and then the other one is called a heterozygous match. So heterozygous means you have two different alleles for one or more genes. So in this case, that's where you have the uppercase and the lowercase together. Um, that's heterozygous. Hetero means different. You don't need to know if it's heterozygous dominant or recessive because that doesn't make sense. It actually has both of them there. So this is uh, typically known as being a carrier where you might carry that trait, that recessive trait. It could be good. It could be bad. But for the most part, you're going to see that dominant feature. Um, so this is what heterozygous organisms look like. 
um, this is what a homozygous, domin homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive organism will look like. So when you get these questions, make sure you're very clear on what homozygous dominant recessive means or heterozygous means because that's going to help you a lot. So this is looking at a real, a few real life examples in a bit that talk about how we can display these dominant or recessive traits. So we have pictures of two politicians and um, Barack Obama on the left has his left thumb over his right thumb and then Mitt Romney on the right, he has his right thumb over his left thumb. So you can actually take a second right now and just take your hands and clasp them together, like just like you're grabbing your hands together. Once you clasp them, you will know that naturally one of your thumbs will fall over the other every time. If you try the other way, it will feel very weird, but just put your hands together and you'll notice. For me, my right thumb always goes over my left thumb. Um, so you can see here that if your left goes over your right, that's dominant. That means you have a dominant allele present. Um, so you have either a um, homozygous dominant here or a heterozygous. Um, so one of your parents truly, truly should have um, this same exact feature. You can guarantee that. Uh, right over left, that is where you have the recessive gene present. So that means I have this TT. So so that means either both of my parents or are homozygous recessive, or at least one of them is homozygous recessive and the other one is heterozygous. Um, and we'll do a Punnett square later to show you how I could end up being uh, homozygous recessive as well. Um, so that's one example. Another good example is attached ear. So if you look at your ear lobe and see if it's either attached to like your head or if it's hanging or free, um, that's a great example of homozygous versus recessive. Um, so that's something that will run in your family. If you ever have children or if you have children or if you can um, see your parents' ears or notice their ears, they should have a similar one. Even look around your brothers and sisters maybe. Rolling your tongue, that's also another example that is a trait i believe it's recessive where everybody can't roll their tongue if try it now i'm sure it's always funny real life to see it but um, a lot of people cannot do that while some people have no problem doing it again it's a gene that's a really easy fun gene to be able to see all right so let's looking at some of these crossing i'm not going to harp on this too long but i want you to understand kind of a little bit of the history of how we're getting here um, so when we're talking about a single factor cross, so something like rolling your tongue, crossing your fingers, uh, eye color, something like that, um, we want to, you know, we remember we started this off with plants. So we're first looking at the P generation. The P generation are the true breeding plants. So that means you had a plant that was purely tall. Um, so you see the homozygous dominant here, or you had a plant that was uh, purely short or a dwarf in this case which was homozygous recessive. So the P generation are those pure um, trait organisms here. Since they're plants, you can cross fertilize them. The first generation you will create is called F1 generation. They're an offspring of the P cross. You're gonna get something called a mono hybrid. Hybrid means mix, mono means one. So all of your organisms he noticed were tall. Genetically, they were heterozygous. They had uppercase T, lowercase T, but all of them were tall. So if you take two organisms from the F1 generation and you cross them, right, they're plants, self-fertilize them, you notice that recessive trait, that little short plant will pop up again. So this lets us know we have some type of, some inheritance pattern. This is giving us some clues as we were trying to figure this out in the early, early days, what's going on. Um, so the same thing is present here. You have a purple flower, a white flower. You mix them together if they're pure. And then you get all purple flowers. You mix the purple together. And then all of a sudden you get this white one again. So that is kind of showing us a little bit about how these dominant and recessive traits work. Again, he did this. To, um, um, Gregor Mendel did this with a whole bunch of different traits, not just colors of flowers, but green wrinkled seeds, um, around versus wrinkled seeds, green versus yellow pods, tall versus short, smooth versus constricted. And he was able to see the same exact thing was happening, right? You have all the dominants in F1, and then you have a nice three to one ratio for the F2s. Um, so let's talk about um, two of his laws that he found out during this process. The first law is the principle of segregation. 
Um, so segregation just simply means to separate. I know there's usually a lot of um, negative connotations with that word, but from a definition point, it just means to separate. So this is a principle of separation. That just means that when we make our gametes, when we make our eggs, or when we make our sperm, that um, your genes are going to separate and pass only one gene. So again, if I was talking about um, my um, my thumb crossing ability and how I'm, I'm homozygous recessive, then that means when I make an egg cell, one of my eggs is going to have that little T. The other egg is also going to have that little T. That just means we're separating them. This is talking about how we can pass along a single trait. And when we do our Punnett square in a little bit, you'll be able to see or it'll show you how this principle occurs. The second law that happens is that once we separate, they're going to be randomly distributed. So that just means that when I made two of my eggs, let's say I'm talking about something a little different so you can see it. It doesn't mean that the little F only goes to the right and the big F only goes to the left. That's not what it means. It just means that they can independently assort. So if for some reason, when I'm splitting up my eggs, I want the little F over here, the big F over there in that egg, that's fine. Um, it just means that they have the ability to randomly um, sort. So also because of this, this is really important because there is equal probability for any combination of genes every time you produce an offspring. So for instance, let's say we start talking about genes where I say there's a 25% chance your child will have blue eyes. That doesn't mean if you have one child and they have blue eyes and that chance is gone. That means every time you um, fertilize an egg and a sperm from these two people, there is a 25% chance of this happening. So that just means that everything happens randomly. You don't lose up the big F at the top because I've already used it and now all my other eggs are going to be um, recessive. That's not how it works. It's just saying every single time you have a new opportunity. So we've been talking about this elephant in the room, the Punnett square. Let's get down to what a Punnett square. By the way, before we even get there, this is what a Punnett square looks like. Real simple. Looks like a window. Um, we're going to be putting alleles over here alleles over here and allele over here and allele over here and then we're going to eventually bring them together to form what our offspring can look like. So a Punnett square is a common way to predict the outcome of just some simple genetic crosses. The very first step, I'm giving you steps to do this, the very first step is writing down the genotypes of the parents. So let's say in this case the male parent is heterozygous, the female parent is heterozygous as well. Step one is always write down the genotypes. Some questions you get, I will tell you the genotype. Some questions I will not. I will need you to use your brain. Step two, write down the possible gametes that each parent can make. Okay, so a gamete is an egg or a sperm. So if this um, male was making sperm cells, some of the sperms would have the dominant trait in there. Some of the sperms would have the lowercase trait in there. Same thing with the female. So you want to write down the possible gametes this can make. You're basically just splitting it apart. Step three is creating this Punnett square. Now, once you've created your Punnett square, all you have to do is either put the male on the top side or the bottom or the side of it. So it's not really bottom side, but this portion of it. It doesn't have to be the males always on the top, the females always on the side. It does not work that way. You can do whatever you want, but you just want to make sure that you're consistent. You don't take alleles from a male and from a female and put them on the top, right? Um, so in this case, we have uh, a dominant T and a recessive T and the same thing for our females, right? So you see that really clearly, but I'm going to erase my little writings. You see on the top, you have the male genotypes we just created or the alleles and then the female alleles that we created and then the final step is just putting them together so in this case if this is a t and this is a t we have two uppercase t's which would be homozygous dominant we have a uppercase t a lowercase t you have heterozygous right and then you go across the board until you finish everything that's a punnett square not too hard as long as you follow those four steps write down the genotypes of the parents 
separate those those gametes or separate that genotype until you get the alleles that you would need or that are required. Create an empty Punnett square, line the gametes across the top or the bottom, depending on if we're talking about the male or the female or the blue bird or the red bird or whatever it is in this case, and then just fill it in. That's all. Now, once you've filled it in, once you have this information, now you'll probably be asked questions about this information. Maybe I'll say, what is the probability or what is the percentage that you'll have, um, that you'll have, uh, what are we talking about, tall, I think, that you'll have tall plants, right? We identify that the uppercase T is being tall while the short is, is the recessive one. Then you would look at this and say, well, I got three out of four, so that's about a 75% chance I'll have tall plants, right? Now, I could say, what is the percent or the probability that you'll have a homozygous recessive genotype? You'll say, well, looking at this picture, the only one that's homozygous recessive is this one, so that's one out of four, which will mean I have a 25% chance of homozygous recessive. Those are the types of questions you can expect to see. Um, again, I guess the fifth step, which I kind of forgot about, is what I just mentioned. So making sure you understand the genotypes, the outcomes from that, and make sure you understand the phenotypes. I'm probably not going to be asking for ratio. I'm going to be asking for percentage. So what's the probability? Probability and percentage are the same thing. I'm looking for numbers that are 25%, 50%. Um, 0%, right? That's what I'm going to be looking for in my answers. So again, this is showing you from start to finish how you start off with your um, your genotype of your parents. You're going to split that into the gametes. You're going to put the gametes on the proper side. You're going to pair them up and then make sure you pay attention to what are the genotypes, which are the alleles, and what are the phenotypes, which would be the um, physical look of them. And then eventually you'll be able to either, you know, share that in an answer or, or something like that. So again, I'm just showing you a few more examples of different, um, different traits so that you can just see this over and over again. Again, talking about different traits, wanting you to see that example as well. So I also wanted to share uh, this one, which is more of a question format. And I'm going to give you a question in, in just a second. But this is an example that's already worked out. So although you have the answer right here, I want you to read this portion on your own and see if you can understand how they came to this particular answer, how they came to these values, that type of thing. Let's do this one. I'm going to put it up on the screen and give you just some time to work on it and pause it right now. And then I'm going to I'm going to start uh, doing it on my own. OK, hopefully you had a chance to do it. Um, but let, let me start doing it just so you can see how one is to be done. So the first thing you want to do is identify the genotype. So in this case, it's very, very clear. The genotypes are outlined. You have, um, this is known as heterozygous. So make sure you start being familiar with those words. The next question will have the words in them. And this is going to be homozygous recessive. Um, so the first thing we want to do is, uh, set up our square. We know GG. So that's going to be one plant. The other one is homozygous recessive. And all I'm going to do is just put them together. So in this case, if you had a question about uh, which percentage are going to be green, right? You would say 50% are going to be green. Which ones are green? This one is going to be green. It's heterozygous, but remember green is dominant. It's uppercase. And um, and if you weren't sure that green is dominant because it's uppercase, if you look here, it's a green plant. So it has uppercase and lowercase, but it's still green. This one has two lowercases, meaning two lowercases have to be recessive, right? Because if the yellow was overpowering, then you would see the yellow here. Right here, you only see the green because it's uppercase. Um, and then if you had a question said, um, you know, what is the breakdown of genotypes in this question? You would say, well, 50% of my genotypes are homozygous recessive and 50% of my genotypes are 
heterozygous, right? That type of thing. Okay, second question here. Um, I will give you a second to look at this one. All right, so pause it if you want to work on it. I'm going to start working on it now. So smooth plants are dominant over fuzzy plants. What are the possible genotypes and phenotypes of a fuzzy plant and heterozygous smooth plant? So I'm not giving you the actual genotypes in this question, which is most likely what you may see, okay? So you have to ask yourself, smooth is dominant over fuzzy. You can pick any letter if you want to do F or if you could do F. I'll do F because F is easier to see between uppercase and lowercase. So I'm, say, I'm saying smooth plants are dominant over fuzzy plants. That means my little f is going to represent fuzzy because that's recessive. My big f is going to represent smooth. Again, they have to be the same letter. So you can pick any letter. They just need to be the same. Only thing that changes uppercase and lowercase. So now I'm asking, what are the possible genotypes? So I'm looking for genotypes and phenotypes, physical characteristics of a fuzzy plant in a heterozygous smooth plant. So I didn't tell you heterozygous, homozygous, anything with the fuzzy, but if I'm telling you the fuzzy is recessive because I said the smooth is dominant, the only option for genotypes for our fuzzy plant has to be FF. Because if it was like this, of course, that's smooth. If it was like this, then that is still overpowering. It's not going to be fuzzy. It's going to be smooth. So the only option is FF, homozygous recessive. I told you this is heterozygous smooth because if I didn't, you could use this answer or you can use this answer, right? You can use this as being smooth or you can use this as being smooth. But I'm telling you in particular, it is heterozygous smooth. All right, so now we can make our little square. Sorry, my square looks kind of bad. Um, I'm saying it is heterozygous smooth, so I will do F, F, and then I'm saying it's fuzzy. So I'll, I'll change the color so you can see the little fuzzy one a little better. All right, and then now we're just doing our pairing. So because I'm, it's hard to change the pin, I'm gonna do this one at a time. You can also do this if you'd like. And then I'll fill in the other color. All right, here, look at that. What are the possible genotypes? So the genotypes we have is we have FF as one genotype, and we also have um, homozygous recessive as the other genotype. What are the phenotypes? Well, the phenotypes is 50% of them will be smooth, and the other 50% will be fuzzy. That. Another question for you. So this is about a heterozygous white rabbit is crossed with a homozygous black rabbit. That's all you got. So take a second on this one. Okay, hopefully you pause it and work through it. I'm going to work through it at this moment. So when you see this question, the first thing, again, step number one is always find your genotypes. I'm not giving you genotypes, so now you have to use your context clues. So if I'm saying you have a heterozygous white rabbit, let's use um, let's use R. They're both rabbits. So heterozygous means automatically means it's going to be uppercase and lowercase. I told you heterozygous. That's a big clue. If you know this represents white, you have to assume that white is dominant. Why? Because that means whatever this is overpowers that other letter. Okay. So that means the white must be dominant. If I say that, now you have to look at the homozygous black rabbit. So because I already established that white is dominant, white is going to be the uppercase letter. Homozygous is the same, so it has to be two of the same letters, which in this case have to be two of the lowercase letters. Okay. So just because one is white and one is black doesn't mean that the black necess always will overpower the white. In this case, in this question, the white is dominant for whatever reason. Think about, I don't know, something like your eyeballs, right? Your eyeballs are going to be white. They have, um, you know, that's going to be dominant over black or any other color, right? Even though white is a lighter color. So keep that in mind. So you just do the simple, uh, simple um, Punnett square we had done before. 
right? We've done this one before. Forgot to put my lines there. And then again, you do the genotypes, the outcome of the offspring. So we're going to end right here. I'm going to actually split this into two videos because um, I know this was a lot to process. So I want y'all to have access to this first. And then I'm going to uh, follow up with the remainder of the heredity questions, which are a little bit more advanced. So make sure you grasp and understand the concepts here before you dive too deep into the remaining lecture that will be posted in a bit. Thank you.